Alright, hey everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about section 11.2, which is energies of solution formation. So we're going to look at uh, the type of energy involved in forming solutions. So first let's talk about solubility. Okay, The whole principle of solubility is based on like dissolves like. And what that means is that compounds that are similar in polarity are going to dissolve in each other. So water is a polar molecule. It will dissolve things that are polar. Uh, the other example is usually uh, oil. Oil is a nonpolar substance, and so it's going to dissolve nonpolar things. Um, that's why oil, uh, dry, kind of the basis of dry cleaning, usually we'll use a nonpolar substance to remove stains like oil and grease instead of washing them in water, which won't do anything for it. Okay, so let's look at the energy involved in forming a solution, which is the enthalpy or the heat of solution. Okay, and there are three main steps to form a solution. First one is to expand the solute. So you're separating the solute into its individual components. This is usually an endothermic process. It requires energy. The second step is to expand the solvent. So water or maybe oil, whatever's doing the dissolving. And in order to expand the solvent, you have to overcome the intermolecular forces that are bonding it together. And this helps make room for the solute. This is also usually an endothermic process. Third step is to actually form the solution. So allow the solute and the solvent to interact, and this is usually exothermic, meaning it's giving off energy. Okay, and so then to find the delta H of solution, we take all three of those steps and add them together. If the overall delta H of the solution is positive, then that means the energy is absorbed. If the delta H overall is negative, then that means that energy is released. So positive, energy absorbed, endothermic, negative, energy released, exothermic. Let's look at a couple examples. Okay, the first one being oil and water. So if we wanted to see if oil and water went together, we would look at the three steps. First step being to expand the solute, or in this case, the oil. Okay, this value is usually small, but for oil, it's going to be really large because oil is composed of really long carbon chains. So, for example, down here, this is an example. Let me circle it for you. This is an oh, good circle, huh? This is an example of oil. You've got all these really long carbons. Maybe a little functional group on the end here, but overall, lots of hydrogens and carbons. Really large molar mass, which means you're going to have really large bonding dispersion forces, making this a large value in this case. And the second part is um, to break apart the solvent. And well, here we have to overcome hydrogen bonds because water is a polar molecule. So this is also going to be a very large value. Okay, then the third part is to put them together. Well, in this case, delta H is very small. That's because interactions between polar and nonpolar substances are very negligible. It's not really going to happen very often. So you've got a large delta H sub 1, a large delta H sub 2, and a very small delta H sub 3. So when we put all those together, we get a very large value for the delta H of solution because okay, we've got endothermic, endothermic, exothermic. And so because this delta H value is so large, that means that the process probably will not occur as seen in the funny cartoon. It says, let's face it, our relationship is doomed and we have oil man and water girl. Here's another example of oil being added to water. You can see it forms droplets. It's not mixing at all. Okay, let's look at the opposite example. A very common one is NaCl and water NaCl being uh, table salt or sodium chloride. So the delta H sub 1 to break apart the solute being NaCl in this case, it's very large and endothermic. This is due to the fact that we have very strong ionic forces um, in the crystal of the structure. And um, actually, if we measure that, it's going to come out to 786 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so here's the what's actually going on. We're taking the solid salt breaking it up into the two gaseous components. The second step is to, again, uh, break apart the solvent. Or just like in the previous example, this is going to be large and endothermic due to the fact that water is polar and has hydrogen bonds. Okay, the third step is to put these two together. Now, other than the oil and water case where they were polar and nonpolar, ionic and polar are going to be very similar. So they're going to follow the like dissolves like rule. So delta H of 3 is going to be very large and very negative, and this is due to the strong interaction between the ions and the water molecule. 
Well, this involves something a little bit different. We're taking water as a liquid, combining it with our, our two gaseous parts from up here, okay, and producing um, an aqueous NaCl and an aqueous CO-. Okay, so we took this one, combined it with water to get this reaction. Well, this actually combines step two and three together. And so if we look at step two and three, the, the delta H on this, when we add them, is negative 783. So although this one's large and positive, this one is also large and negative. So if we take our positive 786 and our negative 783, our delta H total, maybe, and here it's going. There we go. Is going to be small, and it's about a positive three, okay, because we took our negative 783 and our positive 786 and put them together, so we got a positive three. So what this means is that dissolving does require a small amount of energy, but that this is actually going to dissolve because our delta H of solution is very tiny. Okay, and so when we combine step two and three. This is called the enthalpy of hydration, and it's the enthalpy change associated with the dispersal of a gaseous solute in water. So if we go back, that's exactly what we're doing here. We're taking our gaseous solute and we're combining it with liquid water. And so that's called the enthalpy of hydration. And maybe sometime today we'll flip the page. There we go. Okay, and so this tells us that NaCl is soluble because it's more probable that they are, it's going to mix with water versus be a separate state. And solutions or processes will favor things that increase their probability. So if it's more probable that things will mix, then that's what they'll do. If you look at the oil and water example, it is very low probability that they will mix. And so that's part of the reason that that solution will not mix together. The other factor is um, that processes with large amounts of energy tend not to occur. And because our delta H of solution for the oil and water was so large, that's kind of a strike against it. However, if you look at the NaCl in water, our delta H of solution was very small, and so it's going to want to occur more. All right, let's look at another example. So it says... Decide whether liquid hexane, which is C6H14, and it's seen right here, so this is our hexane, or liquid methanol, which is CH3OH, so here's our methanol, is the more appropriate solvent for the substances grease, and uh, we'll talk about why it looks kind of triangular, and potassium iodide, so here's our potassium iodide. Okay, well, what we need to look for is based on the principle of like dissolves like. Here we have a big carbon chain, okay, with all these little hydrogens attached. And so because we don't really have any polarity, this is a nonpolar molecule. Okay, let's look at methanol. Well, methanol has a carbon, but it's also got this OH group, and more specifically, we've got hydrogen bonding. So this is definitely polar. Okay, so now we want to determine our solvents and see which one's going to go with which. Well, if you look at hexane, see how it's kind of triangular in shape? Well, instead of having to draw all those carbon atoms, we instead just make these little triangles. So each point represents a carbon. Okay, so if you count up all the points, there are 20 of them. Well, this is very similar in structure to hexane, so we're going to say that grease is also nonpolar, and so that means that these two are the perfect match. Okay, let's look at potassium iodide. Well, potassium iodide is ionic, which means that it does have some polarity. And so methanol and potassium iodide are also going to go together based on that principle of like dissolves like.